Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, after seeing that very impressive, rather flashy video, you might expect our guest here, Steve Burke, to perhaps be a big egoed, you know, flamboyant uh, visionary leader who's, you know, can run such an organization. Well, he actually is a visionary leader, but the main thing he seems to be able to do is to control the big egos of everybody else uh, that work for him. Because as CEO of NBCU, he's proved to be uniquely successful at taking a media behemoth comprised of all of these disparate channels and brands and theme parks and channels and personalities and getting them to integrate, collaborate, and drive profit. He calls it the symphony concept. And if you look at his numbers, you could consider him the Toscanini of, uh, uh, of media. Because in the last five years, he's led NBC Universal. The company's revenue has increased more than 13%. Its cash flow has doubled. NBC is now the leading network for the 18 to 49 demo. Its news division is back on top. And it's the number one movie studio in Hollywood. And Universal theme parks have doubled their revenue. That is really quite an impressive record. Um, of course, Steve has had a very long career in media. As a Disney executive, he had the opportunity to develop uh, and found the Disney story concept. For mastering technology, uh, revolutionizing the media world, Steve headed Comcast Cable. Uh, president and CEO there, he focused on the business of wiring homes with cable, internet, phone, phone service, and how to get content to customers without any wires at all. In fact, the only constant really in his career has been success. And in pop uh, culture terms, he could very well be the broadcasting world's Steve Austin, its bionic secret weapon. So he's clearly worth a lot more than $6 million to Comcast. Um, before we start on this company that you're running, which has uh, got all these wonderful elements, let's just talk about the debate for one minute last night. Um, because really, it, you know, it, it was another example of the changing world of media in every way. Politics have almost become the new Olympics. I mean, you had, there was, I gather, probably going to be 100 million people who watched last night. What does that tell us about live events uh, and television and all of the access to uh, uh, everything on the, uh, demand at once? Well, uh, first of all, thank you yeah. for being here today, and thank you for the introduction. We do think over 100 million people watched. We have set-top box data that said at least inside the Comcast footprint, over 35% of the homes uh, were turned on to the debate, which would extrapolate to over 100 million. We, it was nerve-wracking for me, and I, I got a, uh, a, a copy of the debate sent to me this morning, 4 o'clock in the morning London time, so that I could watch it, because the host of the debate was Lester Holt, who's the anchor of NBC Nightly News. And um, the, the environment is so tough right now for anybody moderating anything to try to make sure that it's a fair debate. We were very worried and concerned for Lester. He, he ended up doing a very good job. And uh, thinking about the debate, it, it, it strikes me, first of all, that that people will turn out for very large live events. We had, on average, 27.5 million people uh, watching the Rio Olympics in the United States. Um, football games remain a huge, huge thing. When you get a show like The Voice, a lot of people will show up. It is more challenging today, I think, to, to get that universality and to, to find those. The, the number of those events are, are smaller than they were, but they, people will still show up when you get something that unites the whole country. And I think last night, seeing those two candidates on stage was something that people wanted to watch. Well, of course, a lot of people blame NBC for Donald Trump because of The Apprentice, right? You can't, it's you all, can't. This is, it's all his fault. You everybody. can't blame, at the time, first of all, <laughs> Celebrity Apprentice was on 10 years before we showed up. Uh, but Celebrity Apprentice, at, you know, at the time, he was an entertainer and uh, uh, very good at what he did did in that realm. Um, I think NBC News has done a very good job handling the election yeah. and, and trying to get the right issues out. Um, but it's, it's a very interesting time. OK. So obviously, you're killing it now with the numbers at NBC. Um, but when you look ahead you know, for the next you know, five, 10 years, what gives you nightmares? I mean, what keeps you up at night thinking about this company, this business, five, 10 years down the line? Well, if you, if you look at the five and a half years since we've been stewards of NBC Universal, um, 
at the Vancouver Olympics, which were six years ago, the iPad didn't exist. So I would bet the majority of people here have been on their iPad for a long time this morning. And, and that kind of change over the last six years, to me, has been surprisingly rapid. And my bet is it's going to happen in the next six years. And increasingly, a big part of my job is to make sure that we position the company for the future. I think we've done a very good job of taking NBC Universal as we found it and making it more successful and more profitable. But that's only half our job. Half of our job is to maximize the ecosystem that we currently operate in. The other half, which is the harder half, is to get the company ready for the future. By the way, I think those are the two parts of any any management challenge, no matter what business you're in. Except how now you, you have to do it at warp speed. How, exactly, yeah. and and there's a there's a conflict between maximizing the world as it exists and getting a company ready for the world as it will be. You have a lot of people who grew up and succeeded greatly in in the world as it existed. Uh, I'm 58. The world I grew up in is not going to be the world that uh, NBC Universal and Comcast are going to find 10 or 20 years from now. And some of the skills and some of the instincts and some of the behavior that makes you successful in the traditional world can, can actually retard your success in the future. So we're spending a lot of time trying to figure out how to plant the seeds now. The other, the other thing is many of the seeds you plant will not be will not come to fruition for five or 10 years. So if you're, if you're managing a company for a quarter or a year or even a five year period, I think you tend to ignore the future or, or put too much emphasis on the present. But if you're really forcing yourself and forcing your executive team to think five, 10, 20 years from now, shame on you if you don't start to get more digital DNA inside your company and start to plant those seeds. I mean a cultural watershed was reached in my own house about two years ago when my 23-year-old daughter told me to take the TV out of her room because it was in the way, okay? <laughs> um, but she would demand to have Wi-Fi if the Wi-Fi well, was would down for have, absolutely, five but, minutes. But, so how do you make the shift to this new customer who has never watched TV or cable and never will? I mean, you've said yourself that your own five kids will never pay for cable. Well, they may pay for cable someday when they start to earn a decent amount of money. They don't right now. Um, <laughs> they stop freeloading and, on and you. And people, yeah. people do, people do when, when you have a home and you have kids of your own and you uh, have a family and the, and the means to do it, a lot of those people will come back to the traditional cable and satellite ecosystem. But they will never watch shows that they don't want to watch. They will never feel that they have to watch a show when it's on on linear television. They've grown up with DVRs and the ability to move and change. And those changes are permanent. And you can, you can really draw a line. And it's really, it's really right around the end of the millennial age cohort, right around 34, 35-year-olds, um, because those are people who grew up with broadband if they were in a, in a place that had broadband. And they will never consume the same way, and so we as a company have to go to where they are. They're, they're, they're spending an increasing, increasingly large percentage of their time on sites like Facebook, Snapchat, et cetera, and you have to be there. You have to acknowledge that. Our job is to follow eyeballs wherever they are and produce the best content we can and tell stories and provide information however people are consuming that. And so we've got to get ourselves more geared over. That's, that's sort of an obvious, easy conclusion, I think, if you are in, in our business. The harder part is how, how do you do it? You know, if, you're, if your senior management team is much older than that millennial cohort uh, and your senior management team is not spending all day long on Snapchat and in Facebook, how do you make sure that you get people who are and get thinking about those ecosystems into that management team and, and over time migrate a company. And I think in a lot of ways that's a much more difficult challenge than taking a, a broadcaster and, and getting into the cable business. If you think about it, USA is more like NBC than, than NBC is like Snapchat. And the skills that, that made you successful in broadcast transferred fairly easily to cable. So most of the US, big US broadcasters made that transition uh, some more successfully than others, but made that transition fairly gracefully. I think this is much harder. Well, it is hard because there's so much content out there. 
it would seem to me that the number one challenge is how do you find it? How do you break through that noise when you've got something that you want to reach? And how do you find you don't spend so much uh, corporate energy, as it were, chasing after finding people on their various social channels, which sort of drains the energy and, and, and focus? Well, it used to be uh, in the good old days that if you had a show that was the least objectionable show, it would be a success. And <laughs> today, the, the middle of the market is just gone. You know, there, there's no such thing as a okay show. People will do whatever they can to find one of those great big breakthroughs, uh, whether it's a movie or a television show. But, the, but in the middle, if it's an $80 million movie that's kind of okay, or a television show that costs $4 million an hour that is all right, you're going you're gonna to fail. And so a big part of our uh, focus as it relates to the traditional ecosystem is finding those things that have the potential to really break through. And then when you find them, to get all the resources of the company behind them. We, we had a show called The Secret Life of Pets made by Illumination, our animation uh, company, headed by a guy named Chris Melandondri, who I think is this generation's Walt Disney, and we knew we had a wonderful show, but you worry when you, when you have a show that's wonderful that people are so busy and spending so much time being distracted by everything else that you can't get that show out and, and, and make an impact. And so we turned our company upside down, as we do all the time when we have something big, to make sure that everybody we could possibly reach knew that Secret Life of Pets was a great Movie. We did it with the Rio Olympics, and we do it any time we think we have something um, that's really compelling that can, can break through. And that's, that's, that's a focus that I think you have to have because it's so hard to get I'm through the I'm very interested in how you break down silos in a company. I mean, one of the achievements that you've had at NBC, and everybody says it, is that you have managed to get everybody working in the same direction. What's your sort of management technique for doing that? Because we've seen so many companies, and Microsoft was one of them, that failed because everybody was, you know, turf warfare was intense. And people, it's the natural instinct is to protect your bit and, and not, you know, share and not bring people into it. How, how do you do it? Well, there are a lot of ways to run successful companies. And, and there, is, there is a model that says if you have a variety of divisions, let everybody kill each other and maybe the strongest will survive. And, <laughs> Um, and I've worked in environments like that. Um, I didn't enjoy it. Um, and, and I believe, ultimately, that you can set up a company. We have 22 different businesses. If you look at each of our cable channels and our film studio and theme parks, uh, we're very decentralized. The people who run those 22 businesses, I think, get up every morning thinking that it is, to some extent, their business. But they're part of a company that, that stands for for things. We, we basically say you, you must cooperate when, when a movie like Secret Life of Pets comes out or we open Harry Potter in one of the theme parks. It is not optional to, to help promote that when the time comes. Uh, and then we stand for certain ways of doing business. We have a saying, think like an owner, not a renter. And that means it's your job, if you're, if you're the steward of one of our businesses, to think beyond the next quarter to think about the success of the business in a long-term way as opposed to the success of managing your own career in the press or trying to superficially look like you're doing a good job or being self-aggrandizing. So we have a whole, whole series of things, and certainly a handful of things that you need to do if you work for our company. But beyond that, we count on people to run their own business and, and operate in a very decentralized way, but we don't tolerate bickering and fighting and you know, wasting a lot of time. And, and over time, I think organizations are very sensitive to what gets rewarded and what's, what gets punished. And in our company, if you don't cooperate, you, you're not a good colleague, you, you get punished more than you get rewarded. And over time, people figure that out. Mm -hmm. Well, the decision to buy NBC Universal was quite controversial at the time. People remembered the AOL Time Warner fiasco, and uh, they had no reason really to think that uh, distribution and content could work together. Uh, looking back, why did you believe that it was the right move? Well, I, I joined Comcast 18 years ago, and Brian Roberts and I uh, uh, have always believed that content and distribution work well together, but only if you manage it. If you put content and distribution together and just let it kind of flop around and people fight or whatever, then it's not going to work. But if you look at Rupert Murdoch or John Malone, 
time after time after time, they put content and distribution together, and it worked beautifully. And so our dream was to get big on the distribution side, and we ended up becoming America's largest cable company, and then get bigger in content. We had a handful of channels before NBC Universal, but not a, a very large uh, portfolio. So we always thought it made sense. Um, it was not you know, most of the uh, most of Wall Street, the analytical community, thought that we we clearly knew how to be a good distributor. But I think they wondered how we would do once it, it came time to get into the content business. And we also did the deal five and a half years ago. The world was a lot different than it than it is today. The advertising business was depressed. The world was more uncertain and and kind of economically challenged. Um, but we always thought that that um, the content side of, of the business was a wonderful part of the business if you managed it well. You have to manage it well, but if you do, uh, at the time that we bought NBC Universal, the operating cash flow of the businesses was about $3.2 billion, and we paid about $26 billion for the deal. Uh, this year we'll do $7.3, $7.4 billion. So we've created a lot of value. By the way, we should do more than we're doing. Uh, we still have a lot of opportunity. Um, but uh, we really we like the content. We like the distribution business. We like the content business and believe that they're better together. Well, you've done a lot of acquiring and investing recently. Uh, why did you want DreamWorks? Well, DreamWorks was a very, very specific uh, opportunity. Um, we have had such a good experience in the animated uh, film business. And if you look back since the beginning of animated films, no studio has been able to make more than two animated films a year. It's just, it's such a labor intensive and all consuming thing that groups of people can't make more than two animated films a year. The reason why the Walt Disney Company can make four is because they have Disney and Pixar. And they exist with two separate organizations in two different cities. So we, think the animated film business is maybe the best part of the feature film business. And DreamWorks makes two films a year, and we'll now be able to go from two to four. At the same time, DreamWorks is advancing our agenda in a number of areas that are related to the film business. They're, they're in the animated television business, which we are not presently. Um, they have a consumer products business with all the DreamWorks characters. We have a consumer products business. We can put those two together. Uh, and then all the DreamWorks characters will be in all of our theme parks. Uh, and running so in the next election. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of different ways to <laughs> put them together. OK. Well, last week, um, Brian Roberts announced a collaboration with Netflix, which I thought was very interesting, because you guys have been competing for so long. When did this perestroika happen with, with Netflix that you suddenly decided that uh, you and Netflix should be in bed together? What Tina's referring to is on Comcast set-top boxes, um, Netflix is, is going to be integrated, so consumers will be able, be able to access Netflix without turning the television set off or streaming uh, from their computers. You know, the majority of Comcast customers have Netflix. There are 40 million Netflix customers in the United States, and I think... Uh, Neil Smith, who runs our cable business, looked at it and said, to a degree, those Netflix customers are being inconvenienced every time they go from the traditional linear uh, television ecosystem over to Netflix, and why inconvenience them if we have technology that can make that simple? And you can look at it negatively and say, oh my gosh, every person who goes over to Netflix potentially will never come back. But the reality is those Netflix customers enjoy, the vast majority of them enjoy the cable channels they get, and why not make it easier and make it simpler and less um, intrusive and have a happier customer. I mean, what's so staggering with the advent of all the streaming channels is the global uh, community, in a sense, of watches that it's creating. I remember just recently I was in Delhi, and it, we, it had just been the week that the O.J. Simpson uh, miniseries had come out. Uh, I think it's Fox uh, did that. Uh, and people in Delhi were, had all watched it. And it staggered me that you know all of this, these, it was the same discussion over dinner that in Delhi that it was in New York about this O.J. Simpson, and you know Turner Chairman John Martin recently said that one of his top priorities is to generate more intellectually uh, intellectual property that we own and control that isn't easily replicated. 
what does that mean, though, for independent creatives? I mean, is this good or bad news for independent creatives? Because if the beer moths like yourself are owning all of this content, creating all of this content, what happens to the outside production houses? Well, I think we'll, we'll always take a good idea from anyone. You know, I think there are, there are advantages, talking now about NBC or our cable channels, there are advantages in the kind of ecosystem that you're talking about to owning a lot of your own content. But I don't think we'll ever own 100% of our content on any of our channels. Um, and people are constantly looking for great new ideas, and I think great new ideas will always see the light of day um, in both movies and television, just because they're so hard to find. Well, of course, Downton Abbey was an absolutely monster uh, hit, and um, uh, you know you've got several production labels, including Monkey, Chocolate Media, Carnival Films. Um, what did you learn from the Downton Abbey success? I mean, has it made you want to invest more? in uh, UK product and drama? Well, as, as Kevin mentioned, we, we have a huge investment profile in the United Kingdom. Um, working title has been part of our company for a long time. Um, and if you look at all of the films that working title has brought to the market, distributed and marketed and financed by our company, plus Carnival, um, you know, this is a huge, huge market for us. And, and our idea, one of our central ideas is we want to be the best place for talented people to bring their great ideas. And it sounds very simple. Uh, it's harder in practice, but whether it's Steven Spielberg bringing back Jurassic World 11 years after the previous Jurassic, or whether it's uh, the guys at Working Title bringing a great idea uh, to us, we want to be a place where when they bring the idea to us, we respect them. We market the hell out of it. We make sure that every part of the company gets excited about it. Um, and a lot of that's going on in the United Kingdom. And, and a lot of that's going on in places outside of the United Kingdom and outside of the United States. And my prediction is more and more of that will be international. We're less, NBC Universal and Comcast, we're less international than News Corp or the Walt Disney Company or Time Warner. And I, I look at that as an opportunity. So you're going to be expanding in that way, you think? Yes. Oh my God, he's going to be buying something else. I can't take it. Um, how, how is Brexit going to impact um, NBCU? Uh, I mean, Sterling has tanked 10%. Is ITV looking suddenly rather cheap? Well, the, uh, there are a lot of people in this room who, who understand Brexit and the politics of Brexit, but it's, it's concerning. I mean, business people don't like uncertainty. And even if the uncertainty is two, three, four, five years from now, um, we have had such a good experience creatively in the United Kingdom, and it's the headquarters of our international operations that you hope and, and pray that it's going to remain that way forever. And, and, and when you see something like Brexit, the morning after at 7.30 in the morning, I had a conference call, conference call with Kevin saying, what does this mean? And we're watching it very closely and hoping that, it all, that we end up having the kind of experience mm -hmm. here that we've had forever. And what about ITV? No, nothing no to comment? say there, no. But th they're doing a lot of production, pr yeah. own production house. They're, that, they're would be, a lot of, that would fit in with your kind of desire to kind of create yeah, more great content. Yeah, yes and no, yes and no. I mean, we have a very healthy respect for how hard it is to program a network. Uh, NBC is, you know, we're, we're essentially an American company. NBC is in our backyard, and, and I think it's very challenging to think about the network side of free-to-air uh, uh, broadcasting anywhere outside of the United States. I think we'd be more interested in distributing the product that we make and creatively making television shows and movies outside of the United States. When you make a big acquisition, uh, you know, like, for instance, a DreamWorks, uh, or you've just invested in BuzzFeed, which is also very interesting, absorbing new uh, businesses is often very challenging and frequently strains you know, the system inside and, and often looks good on paper, but actually inside it creates a lot of mayhem. What is your sort of philosophy and management technique for integrating these new businesses when you take them on? Well, we've, we've really built our company through acquisition. Uh, 20 years ago, we had 4 million cable customers, and that was pretty much the whole company. And today we have 22 million cable customers, about the same number of high-speed data customers in all of NBC Universal, and really the, the, the major growth engine has been acquisitions. And our 
primary idea is that uh, if it takes a year between signing and closing, use that year to really get a plan and make sure that it's not ambiguous at all, that it's completely clear what the mission of the company is, who's in charge, and who does what the day the deal closes, and that you have to take a very activist role and make difficult decisions if it means people leaving the company or, or, or major changes. But we've found that that's, that's your best bet to, to, to get right on it and not sit back and say, well, well, we'll learn more about the company and get going. Um, and we found that that works well. We were applying that same discipline to, to DreamWorks. Jeff Shell, who runs uh, the Universal Studio, has a team, and, and they've been spending a huge amount of time on it. And it, and, and it means that the first six months or 12 months are, is very, very busy and all-consuming. But organizations need to know what the plan is, need to know who's in charge. And our experience, at least, has been if you hit the ground running and, and, and are very proactive, you'll do better. I mean, with BuzzFeed, presumably this was an attempt uh, or a desire on your part to bring in digital people who are digital natives as opposed to people who have learned it as a sort of learned skill. What kind of impact is BuzzFeed having on NBCU? Well, about a year ago, we put $200 million into BuzzFeed and $200 million into a company called Vox. And we, did, we actually announced both deals at the same time. And we're hoping to make money on the, on the investments. We didn't do it to lose money. But the, the real reason why we invested in both companies is because we think they do things we, we, we thought last August and still think today, they do things that we need to learn how to get good at that we are not good at. Um, BuzzFeed is an extraordinary source of content that, that has amazing capabilities in terms of getting things viral onto Facebook, onto Snapchat, all their distributed content. And if you look at a lot of our uh, digital businesses, we have 50 digital businesses inside NBC Universal. They are much better at that than we are. Uh, and we've learned a tremendous amount. We have a list of 10 or 12 things that we're doing with BuzzFeed right now. We work very closely with them on, on all, all aspects of our, of our business and their, and their business. A great example about BuzzFeed, when the Rio Olympics came along, we decided we really should have a Discover channel on Snapchat. And NBC Sports uh, thought that was a good idea as well and instinctively said, well, we have the people to program a Snapchat uh, Discover channel. And any of you who've been on Snapchat, it, those Discover channels look a hell of a lot different than what you see when you see a highly produced Olympic broadcast on NBC. And so we went to BuzzFeed and said, why don't you do the NBC Olympic Snapchat channel? And the, a lot of the people inside NBC Sports considered that heresy. And, and we said, well, come back and tell us your first few story ideas. Their first, BuzzFeed's first story idea was, what if you ate as much as Michael Phelps, but never exercised? <laughs> and you could see the producers from NBC Sports were just aghast, but the reality is that 12 people that Snapchat sent down to Rio, probably average age 25 or 26, did a wonderful job with, with the Olympic Snapchat channel. And anybody who went on and, and participated and, and watched the Olympic Snapchat channel, in my opinion, were more likely that night to watch NBC uh, during prime time. So I think a company like ours has to be honest and willing to say, okay, we do, not all this expertise resides in the company, so how can we acquire or invest or build or hire to get better at that? And um, the last year with BuzzFeed and, and with Vox has been great in that regard. Well, with the Olympics, obviously, you made a huge bet um, in 2011 when you got the exclusive rights. Um, uh, you paid $7.75 billion to present the Olympics, I gather, through 2032. But since then, the migration to mobile has been fast and furious. So what lessons did you learn from Rio that you're going to be applying four or five years from now? And are you a bit nervous about the fact that with the timelines of the different ones coming up in Asia and so on, which are really antipathetic to you know, the American audience, uh, how, are you going to, uh, how are you going to keep that traction going and that aggregated viewership when it's going to be so uh, disseminated and, and on such different time zones? So we have the Olympics, as you said, through 2032, which is another 16 years. And we did the deal maybe two years ago. And when we presented the deal to our board, 
our board said, well, how do you know what television is going to look like in 16 or 18 years? And our answer was, we don't know. We have the right in the deal to, uh, to deliver the Olympics however technology evolves. So if, for whatever reason, the Olympics are, all of television viewing is done on a SVOD basis or anything else, we can, we can evolve as audiences change. But our real bet was that 16 or 18 years uh, later, that large numbers of people will, will resonate with the Olympics for the same reason they resonate today. That they're just, it's a wonderful event that celebrates the best in humanity and um, that large groups of people, including families, 16 or 18 years will continue to watch. Um, the Rio ratings were down about 15% versus London. And there was a lot of press saying, oh, millennials aren't showing up, not watching. The reality is um, 100 million people watch the Olympics on digital. And as I mentioned, 27 and a half million watched um, on average live. So millennials love the Olympics. And it was by far the most successful financially and every other uh, sort of in terms of the metrics that we use to measure success. And advertisers lo loved it. Every single night of the Olympics, if you add up the ratings of ABC, CBS, and Fox and multiply that sum by three, we beat that every night. So for the 17 days of the Olympics, we were so dominant that if you're a big advertiser, that's exactly what you want if you're trying to create a brand or, or change people's perception about an existing brand. Mm -hmm. Well, Shane Smith made a lot of noise when he spoke at the uh, television conference in August when he said the 50-second TV advertising slot is finished. What are your sense of that? I mean, what, where, how, is, how are you going to still continue to monetize all of these different efforts with advertising also uh, entirely changing the way it, it, it puts its, its uh, you know, t focus? Television is still a very good business. And it's going to be a very good business for a long time. I, I was at ABC 20 years ago and sat in a room with a bunch of strategic planning people who predicted that in 15 or 20 years, broadcast television would cease to exist in the United States. And I think it's a true statement that if you look at the bro broadcasters in the United States, we, we collectively make more today than we did 20 years ago when we made that bet. So. The people like to say, okay, everything's completely changing in a day and it's all going to go away. The traditional television business is still a very good business. The movie business, if you do it right, can be a very good business. The theme park business can be a very good business. I do think it's unlikely in the next 10 or 20 years that the, that the television business is going to grow the way it has in the last 10 or 20. But that doesn't mean it's not still a very good business. And shame on us if we don't... Uh, increase that growth rate or, or, or have ambition to increase that growth rate by investing in some of the new technologies. But to say that it's going away, mm -hmm. I think, would be doing a disservice to these are still very good businesses and will continue to be. Well, as you watch your five kids watching uh, uh, being consumers, what are you learning from their habits and, and what are you, well, how has it affected your own viewing? What do you watch? Well, I try as much as I can to get on Instagram, get on Snapchat with my kids and, and on my own. It will never be second nature to me the way it is to my kids. Um, I still love aspects of linear television. Um, we have a show called This Is Us, which uh, today's a Tuesday, so it'll be on tonight uh, in the United States, com coming after The Voice. It is a beautifully written show about a bunch of different families and um, the, the ability of a great television show to unite the country and unite people um, is something that I think will exist for a long time. So I'm, I'm straddling. My, my own behavior is more of someone my age, but I'm trying as hard as I can to pay attention to people who didn't grow up the way I grew up. Well, I'm told that at NBC you, uh, you're now having digital mentors coming in. That, that, that you, that, that executives have been given digital mentors, which sounds a little uh, daunting. Um, do you have your own digital leprechaun who arrives and tells you uh, what to think? And is it actually working? Or is this attempt to straddle the generational divide between those who are digital natives and those who have to learn it impossible? Are, are the universal executives going to have to get younger and younger 
uh, to address this? And where does the knowledge go? I don't think it's impossible. I think you have to be curious. I think mm -hmm. you have to enjoy spending time with people like Jim Bankoff of Vox or Jonah Peretti at BuzzFeed or, or some of our digital executives, Paul Yanover at Fandango, and asking them what they're working on, what they're excited about. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of times in, in one's career where you, you get associated with a business you've never been in before. And I think as long as you ask questions and have real passion and try to identify people who are better than you at, at doing certain things, you can succeed. And I certainly hope that's true with the digital transition. And we'll make a lot of mistakes. Um, you know, we're a company that makes mistakes all the time with movies and television shows. And undoubtedly, we'll make mistakes in terms of digital. But I think the biggest mistake we could make of all is just sitting and saying, OK, we, we like the existing ecosystem, and we're going to forget about yeah. all this stuff. OK, so looking just ahead again, uh, as we um, sort of draw to a close here, what are you excited about coming up with NBC? And what have you got your eyes on as a new development that you would like to um, feel that you're in a few years from now? Well, maybe, maybe the biggest surprise uh, that we had uh, in the last five and a half years is how good a business the theme park business is. And as a, as a company that was primarily concentrating on television and to a secondary degree, movies that were on television channels and on cable systems, we really didn't have much experience with the theme park business. I had worked in the theme park business when I was at Disney 25 years ago. But as a company, Comcast had no experience with it. And it is a really good business. And it's very, very related to the intellectual property that you make when you make animated films or big movies like Fast and Furious or Harry Potter. Uh, and I think if you go out 15, 20, 25 years from now, families increasingly will want to have vacations where they're not surrounded by technology and where they're at a place where they can share experiences. So I'm very excited about the theme park business. I also like the fact that it's a business where if you build it, they will come. If you have great creative and great attractions and build great hotels, you can grow it by investing and, and getting the returns on that investment. And you know, you've been a, now a media executive for a long time, and you just renewed your contract for another, what, three years, is it? Four. Four, OK. Who's counting? Please count. Uh, what's the biggest change that you've seen? I mean, you've been in this business now a long time. You were at ABC, uh, you were at Disney. You've now been at Universal, NBC, and you've extended. What's the biggest change for you, personally, in running this company now to how it was when you were you know, I'm, I'm sure everybody who, everybody forever has been saying, boy, things are more complicated now. But it, I, I, think, I think in our, in the media business, things are infinitely more complicated. And on one hand, you can look at that and say, and be intimidated by that. And you, you literally can't pick up a newspaper without reading three or four stories a day about technologies that are impacting the businesses that we happen to be in. Um, but I look at it and say, what could be more exciting t than to be in a company that's right in the middle of all this, that's right in the middle of the most exciting, impactful change in a generation, which is the internet and how it's changing all, all the ways that we consume and are entertained and informed. So, and, and to me, that raises the challenge of all these jobs and in some ways makes them more exhausting and more difficult. But it's also a hell of a lot more fun and more interesting and when you stimulating. Come to, when you hire people, are you looking for something different to what you were looking for 20 years ago? I think so. I think that you're, you're, you're looking more for, for people who are curious and passionate and willing to change. Um, and if somebody came into my office wanting to join our company and, and they clearly had no interest at all in how the world is evolving, um, I wouldn't be interested in them. I mean, I, I think you have to. You, you, have to be, you have to be aware of all the challenges and all the opportunities that this new digital world is creating and get excited about it. If you're not, you're not going to succeed. Well, thank you, Steve Burke, very much. We could go on for much longer. But I think as a kind of tour de raison of, of the world we're in, uh, it's remarkable how much you've done and seen. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you.